Hello and welcome to this evening's edition of the Organist on Cause, where tonight we're joined by the one and only Keith Beckingham. <laughs> Hello, Keith. Hello, Damon. And welcome to the Cotswolds. It's lovely to see you in this part of the world. And thank you for having me. I think I'd better warn you before we get too far into this that at any moment my over affectionate dog might appear on the scene. My wife has taken her for a walk, but when she comes back, she will make you very welcome. Thank you for the no warning, more. yes. <laughs> uh, obviously, for those who are listening, uh, bits of this will appear on the show, but if you want to watch the whole unedited, uninterrupted <laughs> yeah. thing, you can do so uh, on YouTube. So, Keith, I'd best ask you, what are your first musical memories? Well, I grew up in that um, pre-social media era, uh, even pre-television era, would you believe? I'm not that old, but... You know. <laughs> um, we grew up, we had to make your own entertainment. And I was lucky. I grew up in a very musical household. My father had been a church organist for 13 years. He had his own dance band in the 1920s, 1930s. My wife was a well-known singer in the area among local uh, amateur dramatic societies and had a lovely singing voice. I had an uncle that played the organ. Uh, he was at St Barnabas Church in Beckenham. Uh, and later uh, in his retirement actually became the organist at Crediton Parish Church, which had a magnificent organ, still has. Um, so there was always music at home. I grew up with my father playing the piano, my mother singing occasionally, my uncle coming round, my cousins both played the violin. There was always music going on in the in the home. And, you know, you, you it's a bit like watching your father driving a car. It makes you want to drive. And when I saw him playing the piano, I thought, well, that's what you do when you grow up. So those are my earliest memories. And how did that then transcribe to... Uh aged 14, playing at the Granada in Woolwich. Well, we, we can go in, in we, we, we just build up to that because okay. um, my first, well, first of all, I had piano lessons, obviously. Yep. And I was lucky I had a very, very good piano teacher. I then um, became obsessed with organs, uh, mainly in those days it was classical organs. Uh, I remember um, being invited to by the organist at um, Canterbury Cathedral to go up into the organ loft for Evensong. Okay, yeah. And that was a revelation. Uh, and I was just transfixed with organs. Um, I'd learnt the piano, and by the time I was 10, uh, I was at the BIF with my father, the British Industries Fair, and I was actually asked by Leslie Sperling to play a little single manual organ that he had there. And it was the first time I found a crowd that was formed to listen to what I was doing. What they didn't perhaps realise was the official demonstrator was Bill Davis. <laughs> <laughs> and he was doing some wonderful things in the background, which made this small organ sound like, you know, everything. And uh, so that was my first kind of experience in playing in public. Um, but the cinema organ uh, came into my life mainly through listening on the radio. Yeah. Um, I suppose I listened to Sandy. Yeah. Um, I certainly listened to Reg Dixon. I love this sort of excitement of the big crowd and the tarball. Yes, yeah. Um, and um, then my first experience uh, of seeing an organ or hearing an organ um, was in about 1955. My father picked me up from school. I was at Beckenham Grammar School. We were driving to the Regal Cinema in Beckenham. And I remember my father saying, oh, at one time I had this dreadful organ. Uh, it was a Verlitz, so I think, German. Because these things went out of favour with the war, you know. <laughs> it was a dreadful thing. It sounded like from one side. And the only organist that made it sound half decent was Reginald Fort when he came as a guest. But, yeah. oh, a dreadful thing. <laughs> I wonder what happened to it. We go into the cinema, we arrive, we're going to see the Dan Busters. And uh, we get there as the B-movie is finishing. Yes, yeah. And next thing is, we hear this glorious organ music. Yeah. And I, I can't, I think this is absolutely lovely. And I looked down, we were sitting in the circle. I looked down and I could see the organ concert, but just the, the glow of the, uh, the, the lights around the horseshoe surround and this, yeah. this head and playing and these lovely sounds coming out. The head never moved. Yes. Now, my father was very cynical. He said, that's not a real organist. Because that's not that organ that I remember. He said, what they've done, they put a tailor's dummy there, because it's not moving, is it? Yes, yeah, yeah. And they put some speakers up where the organ used to be. Well, I didn't believe this, because this lovely music went on, and in those days, some of the... They got round to the trailer. Some had a soundtrack, some didn't. Yeah. And this organ interweaved. Uh, and it was just absolutely fantastic. We rang up the Regal Cinema afterwards to ask, but did they have an organist? The person at the other end didn't know. They thought they might have, and it could be a chap called Reg. But as most organists were called Reg, I <laughs> yes, was none yes, the wiser. Yeah. So I started to go uh, every week, and I would sit in the circle with a pair of binoculars, and I would watch, and it was somebody live playing. Yeah. 
it was a long time afterwards that I found out it was Reginald New. Okay. Yeah. And who had this habit of playing absolutely motionless. The other organists were all over the... Reg was just playing. Yeah. And he was a fine, fine musician. And I really got... I was very shy. Now, you might not believe this, Jeff. <laughs> uh, but I, I was very, very shy, Damon. And... Um, uh, in fact, Tony Moss, you remember the great Tony yes, Moss? Yes, well, I never met him, but... Well, he was a lovely character, had a glorious voice. Yes. And when I rejoined and came back into the cinema organ world, he came up to me and he said, what happened to that shy young man that joined the cinema organ society when he was 13? <laughs> so, uh, but I was very shy and I kind of liked this idea of being a cinema organist. It was so anonymous. Yes. And playing and nobody quite knowing what you're doing, but you're producing lovely music. Yes, that yeah. Anybody that knows what they're listening to will appreciate so, next thing, see an advert in the local paper for the Davis Theatre at Croy with Molly Forbes at the organ. So I go along to the Davis Theatre, yep. expecting the same sort of thing she's going to be playing away there while the things on the, the ads are on the screen. No. I hear this glorious sound, Chanson de Maton by yeah. Elgar was her signature tune, and it wafted through from this great big dome in the ceiling. It was a 4,000-seater cinema. Yeah. And this console rose up in the spotlight, Four Manual Compton, yep. in the old days, one of the old Comptons that had multicoloured stops. Yes. Yeah. And there was Molly playing. She came up to slide level. There are slides on the screen, a Brennograph effect, which I found out about later with the cloud effects. Yeah. And she played the selection of tunes called Out of the Blue. All the tunes had blue in the title. Yeah. And then at the very end, at the last tune, which was Rhapsody in Blue theme, she took the organ right up to the top, took her bow and played the last reprise from Rhapsody in Blue going down. Well, I was gobsmacked. Now, but I was confused because from being this little shy boy who could play in the cinema, arm, but would I have the bottle to ever do that? Yes. Because that was a different way of life. Yeah. Um, in, in the meantime, I had to learn to play. Um, we couldn't afford an electronic organ. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents weren't, and they were very expensive anyway in those days. So my father, who was very resourceful, um, found a, an old American reed organ. In okay. the church, yeah. we got this home, and um, my mother wouldn't have it in the house. It was <laughs> dummy pipes, uh, Victorian scrolls. I mean, it was horrendous. <laughs> so it was relegated to the garage. And anyway, Dad said, "Look, you've got to learn to play the pedals." But of course, you had these two big pedals. And I said, "Look, Dad, I, I, how will I be able to pump this organ yeah. and then play pedals?" Yes, yes. Well, the idea was shelved for a little <laughs> while. Until my father, my ever resourceful father, made a startling discovery. Reed organs work from suction, not pressure. So we looked around the house and saw, where is a readily available source of suction? And our <laughs> eyes fell upon my mother's hoover. <laughs> we put this in the back of this reed organ. It was like putting a supercharger on a car. It took, it was fantastic. So dad then set about building a pedal board. We got some actual pedals from an organ builder, but he went to the local church where I was allowed to practice and took the measurements and he actually made a pedal board. Okay, yeah. So I was then learning the pedals. Mm -hmm. And as I was getting more confident then, Dad also made another important discovery. There was a lovely dual purpose, three manual, 13 rank Compton at Lewisham Town Hall. Yeah. You could hire it by the hour, half a crown an hour. In new money, 12 and a half pence. So I'm down there playing, spending all my pocket money. <laughs> Uh, and the hall manager must have taken pity on this poor kid going down, spending all this money playing. So he got me a few gigs playing for shows there. Yeah. And, of course, knowing that the money I earned from the gig would go back into the half crown an hour session. So uh, that was fine until a, a reporter from the local newspaper picked this up. And the next thing is I had my picture in the local paper playing this organ. I've been playing for a show there at Lewisham Town Hall. Well, to my amazement, I then had a phone call from a man called John Bacon who was manager of the Regal Cinema in Beckenham, saying, would I like to go along and try the Wurlitzer? Well, I mean, I mean, did I want to play the Wurlitzer? The Pope got a balcony. I mean, <laughs> um, I was so excited about going down that he took me down to this incredible organ. I mean, it was my first uh, close-up of a Wurlitzer. Yeah. Um, and there it was in all its glory. It was a lovely-looking organ, uh, illuminated surround uh, and, and so forth. And uh, so I, I tried it and... Lovely to play, uh, much easier to play than Lewisham Town Hall. Yes, yeah. Um, and then, unfortunately, I, John Bacon dropped rather a bombshell on me because he said, well, um, how would you feel if I had told you I got an audition for you to go and meet Joseph Seal 
uh, at the Regal Kingston. And I then put two and two together, and that was unless I was approved by Mr. Seal, I wasn't going to be playing at the Regal. Yes, yeah. So down I go to the Regal Kingston and met Mr. Seal, very charming. And I remember his words. He said, right, Sonny. He said, I'll take you down to the organ, show you where everything is, leave you on it for an hour, and then I'll come and listen to you. If you play the way I want you to play, then I'll be delighted to approve you to play for the Miners' Matinees at Beckenham. If you don't, I don't want any tantrums. So anyway, of course, playing Kingston was a joy. It was yes, a lovely yeah. organ. Oh, you know, heaven. And anyway, Mr. Seal came down and said, oh, you play very nicely, Sonny. And uh, uh, I was then playing every Saturday at the Regal Beckenham. And uh, that went on uh, for a while. Um, and then in the meantime, I had joined the COS. Yeah. And I got to know Eric Offer and Dennis Matthew, who were officers of the COS at that time. Very, very helpful. Uh, introducing me to recorded music, George Wright records, things like that that I'd yeah. never heard of. And uh, Eric was doing some work at the time with a local composer. And they were performing some of his compositions at various places, um, including the Granada at Greenwich. Mm -hmm. And I went along and I heard them play and I got to know Jack Tripp, the manager, who must have heard me play at some time when they were rehearsing. And the next thing is, Jack Tripp said, would you like to enter a talent competition? So, yeah, okay. And I played in this talent competition. And as a result of that, he asked me if I would like to do a series of interludes. So it's taken a long time to get there, but here we are. I'm now the, playing at the Granada Greenwich. <laughs> I think I was 13 at the time. Yes, yes. And so when was it that you adopted your signature tune? Uh, you Wonderful You. Ah, that came much, much, much later. Okay. Uh, I had my own signature tune when I was playing at the, at the Granadas, um, which I composed myself. Later on, when I started to broadcast, I used a composition by Peter Warlock, uh, which, to be perfectly honest with you, was rather like Gerald Shaw's signature <laughs> tune played backwards. But uh, uh, don't tell anybody about that. But it was rather nice. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, when I came back to the organ, I thought that was a bit too, uh, it just didn't seem to work. And let's do something a bit brighter and more breezy. And that's when you, wonderful you, came along. And there we go. So we talked about your early influences being sort of Molly Forbes and Reginald New. Who else was there that you committed well, when you oh, listened to? Well, can I tell you that my first, well, the first COS meeting I went to, I actually played at because okay. it was at Lewisham Town Hall. Yeah. And I did the cameo spot. But Charles Saxby was the guest artist um, who played mainly a classical programme. But my first, what I call my first real CRS meeting was at the Trocadero Elephant and Castle, okay. where I heard, would you believe, Reginald New and Jackie Brown. Well, I mean, you can go. you, a combination <laughs> like that is made in heaven, isn't it? Uh, Reg New, by that time, was very much into his classical uh, era, uh, played the Ride of the Valkyries. I mean, stuff that I knew I could never, ever play. Yeah. Then Jackie came up, and he just played the words the way I think it deserved to be played. It, it was just heaven. Yeah. Um, his lovely harmonies registrations, this lovely way of segueing from one tune to another. Uh, it's just magic. And in my mind, um, to say it's attainable, it sounds bombastic, but I certainly couldn't do what Reg New did, but I yeah. could see perhaps with a lot of practice, a lot of hard work, I might get nearer to what Jackie was doing. Yeah. Well, how about we listen to a little bit of Jackie Brown now, perhaps at the Granada in Tooting? So, absolutely. That was a marriage made in heaven. Did you ever play the tooting organ? Well, I did my first broadcast from there. Well, there we go. Well, let's uh, talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was very lucky, actually, because I got in just at the tail end. You know, we had the half-hour broadcast every yes, day. Yeah. They got moved from 10 till, I think, half past 12 to 1. And um, I was contacted um, by Charles Clark Maxwell. He had taken over as producer of these programmes. His secretary contacted me and said that uh, Mr Clark Maxwell might be interested in using you on the air, could I send in a, a tape? And I sent a tape of a concert I'd done for the COS at the Granada Welling. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, I didn't—I never heard anything back. I just got a contract with the post. <laughs> and I couldn't believe my luck. And it was to record this program at the Granada Tooting. Now, I, I'd heard Tooting many, many times, and particularly in the capable hands of Jackie Brown. Yes, yeah. um, and it was a lovely organ. It had a wonderful spread of sound right across from these understage chambers. And... Uh, so anyway, I made arrangements to go down and try it. And as soon as I tried it, oh, heaven, <laughs> heaven. Um, and such a wonderful organ, because it was like playing a Hammond, instant response. Yes, yeah. And my broadcast was coming up towards Christmas. 
Um, and so um, I put this together, ending up with a Christmas medley. And it was quite funny because I, it went out on the air, it was recorded, it went, went out on the air. And at the end of the programme, the continuity announcer was a chap called Roger Moffat, who um, had rather a, a strange sense of humour. Uh, but he came on and he said, uh, if I hear any more Christmas music, I think I'll burst into tears. <laughs> and I took that as a compliment. But many people thought it was insulting yeah. to me, but I, I never took it that way. Um, so Roger Moffat and I were, <laughs> will always be quite friendly. But, uh, but that was the first broadcast I did. And uh, uh, I was so lucky having that gorgeous organ to do it on. And you also did a broadcast from Granada Harrow. Yes, they just restored the Granada Harrow at that time. It was the Mark II yes. type. I think, you, I think your broadcast was the first one. It was from, on the, the, uh, from, the from, from Harrow yeah. after the restoration. And it was in fine voice. And I must say that it sounded like a lot more than eight ranks. Well, those uh, Mark II Granada oh, organs certainly did. Very well thought out. They, you have to get your head around them um, to, to really enjoy it. Yeah. And I remember Jackie playing at Granada Welling. Mm -hmm. That was a Mark II. Yeah. And he had used his experience because he was based at Granada Slough for a long time after the Second World War. And he knew these eight rank Mark IIs inside out. And yeah. he really made Welling talk. And I think it's one of his best performances. And I picked up one or two tips by watching what he was doing. And I felt very much at home on it. Well, uh, to drag you back in time, I do have a copy of your broadcast from the Granada you in Harrow. Th send it to Sotheby's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we can hear a little bit of it now. So uh, I think you played a selection from The Boyfriend. I did indeed. It. So uh, let's have a listen to that. Keith Beckingham there at the Granada in Harrow with a selection from The Boyfriend. Now, we talked about your first COS meeting uh, with Jackie Brown and Reginald New. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the, the, the COS and the TOC like in those very early days? It was different to the way it is now. Um, the, first of all, nobody got paid. Yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was a club or a society, and people came together, organists came together from the social side. They would meet up together. Uh, sometimes at the local pub. Mm -hmm. I know Robin Richmond from time to time did smuggle a bottle of something into the back row of the stalls <laughs> to share with Gerald Shaw and people of that calibre. But uh, no, it was informal. Yeah. Um, the meetings would start by often the Saturday morning organists demonstrating the ranks. A bit of a soul-destroying task, actually. Um, unless you were very good, it could be infinitely boring. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, then there would be these cameo spots and there were four of us actually at that time, all of a similar age. Yeah. There was Len, Len mm -hmm. Rawl, John Mann, yeah. uh, Graham Wright, and myself. Yeah. Uh, I think I was the youngest of the four, but we would gather together and we got to know each other and our parents got to know each other. Um, and um, we were competitive, I've got to be honest, <laughs> because we were all trying to catch the eye of Doug Ballam or Ralph Bartlett yes, in the yeah. hope we'd be asked to do one of these 15-minute cameo spots. And... In fairness to Doug and Ralph, they did see fair play. And I don't think any of us got any favours. I think we were equally given opportunities to play. And it did give me the chance to play many different instruments. Yeah. The problem is, of course, you're thrust onto the thing. You haven't time to set up pistons. And um, Compton in particular, where your registration is very critical. Yes. Uh, the yeah. Wurlitzer is very much more forgiving. Uh, and I can remember making a prat of myself on various <laughs> occasions, but we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any seriously disastrous moments? <laughs> yes. Well, I, well, I, 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 certainly in my mind, I can remember Eric Offer was very kind to me. He took me around to many different COS meetings. Yeah. My father was tied up. And, and um, we went down on this occasion down to Margate. Mm -hmm. And it was to hear the organ at Dreamland, yes. um, played by Lawrence James, who also played at a place on the coast called Uncle Tom's Cabin, a cabin where there was a Hammond. Okay. So it was a kind of day out. And again... Um, we had the cameo spot and I was invited to get up and play the Dreamland organ. It's a four manual Compton with some extra ranks by Noteman. And uh, I made a complete pig's ear of this. It had a most frightening time delay. Oh yes, yes, I've heard and, about this. <laughs> uh, the stops weren't always in the same order. Um, I mean, I think I got by, but I was unhappy with my performance, let's say. I'm always very self-critical, but on that occasion, I think I had reason to be. <laughs> Particularly, and just to take that one stage further, many, many moons later, my very good friend Michael Wattenbach and his son David contacted me, would I like to play a concert at Dreamland Margate? And these memories came rushing back. And I actually drove down with Helen all the way down to Margate to try the organ first. Yes. 
And it was a different instrument. Yeah. Uh, um, David had done so much work on it, and it was glorious. And he had actually uh, recorded what I was doing, and we went back to his house afterwards, and he played this back, and you could hear what the organ sounded like to the audience. Yes. It was far yeah, better yeah, than yeah. the console. And it was a lovely organ. It's just a shame that's still it's, not it's in action. It's sat there uh, oh. dormant. Do you think the introduction of the COS and the TOC was good for artists who otherwise in previous years had been doing their own separate things in separate cinemas? Well, yes, I think that, first of all, um, I mean, the demise of the cinema organ and of cinema organist, for that matter, was a, was a cruel thing. Yes. These people have been heroes uh, broadcasting to the nation, um, stars in their local cinemas, and then suddenly, after the Second World War, everything changed. Um, and these meetings gave these people a chance to come along and play to a, a, a very keen and appreciative audience yeah. uh, and gave them a chance. Uh, I mean, of course, many others went into different things and moved into electronic organs and so forth. But there were some of them that were big names before the war, but that hadn't made this adjustment. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a great pleasure to hear them. Yes, yeah. So we can't not have an interview without talking about the Hammond Organ Company and your involvement. So <laughs> how, how did that come about? Oh, right, OK. Um, I was organ mad, as you obviously have detected when yes. I was a youngster, coming up to the time when the careers officer spoke to me yeah. and uh, picked up on the fact that I was interested in the organ. Um, but I was also looking at doing something that would have a, some stability, which mm -hmm. was very much what my parents had in mind. Yeah. Anyway, he fixed up for me to have an interview um, with um, Bob Bansell, who was the entertainment director uh, of Butlin's Holiday Camps. Mm -hmm. um, Bob was a very nice guy and we had a long chat. And he picked up on the fact that I played the organ and we were discussing the possibility of perhaps my doing a summer season and coming in and helping him in the office in the winter months. But in order to do that, I had to go and have an audition with Eric Easton, who was in charge of organists at that time yeah. for Butlins. And uh, I went and took this audition on a Hammond Model E, uh, passed the audition, and would have otherwise, I think, have gone to work for Butlins, except for one throwaway remark that Eric made as I was leaving. He said, oh, pop into Booze in Hawks in Regent Street. They've just got the latest Hammond models in. Yeah. And uh, go in and tell them what you might be doing, and I'm sure they'll let you try the instruments. So I bowled as brass, walk into Boozy and Hawks, lovely showroom in Regent Street, ask if I can play. Yes, of course. Play for about 20 minutes. The next thing is this chap comes up and says, oh, the manager wants to talk to you. And I thought, well, I haven't broken this thing. I mean, why does he want to talk to me? <laughs> anyway, I'm called into the, the office and uh, I'm offered a job um, alongside Ina Barger. And uh, the only condition was I had to start very quickly, yeah. like the next week. Okay. I'm still at school. Well, my father then had the job of going along and talking to my headmaster. And the response actually was very good because my headmaster had heard about this Butlins thing. And in the vestibule of our grammar school, there were these boards that had various names of people who had gone on to different things. So yeah. you had, you know, Brown going on to Oxford University, um, Smith, uh, London School of Economics. And then he saw Beckingham Butlins. And being slightly snobbish, I think he didn't think that kind of fitted. Yes. Whereas <laughs> Becky and Boozy and Hawks had more of a ring of confidence. Yes, yes. So I was allowed to leave school, rushed off to Burton's to be measured for my first business suit, and off I went to work with Ina. And uh, at the time, I'd moved on from the Regal at Beckenham, and I was playing at the Gaumont New Cross, okay. where certain parts are still at Saltaire, incidentally. Yes, yeah. And a uh, nice little 2 9 word it's And, uh, of course, next is I had to work on alternate Saturdays. So um, effectively, uh, well, my father covered for me when I couldn't play there. Yeah. But then Ina came along and of course she was the senior person and said, oh, Keith, would you mind doing all the Saturdays? I'd like to do my shopping on Saturdays. <laughs> well, you couldn't say no, could no. you? <laughs> so that was the end of my uh, involved the Gaumont New Cross. <laughs> I was very sad to say farewell to a lovely, sweet sounding, well, it's a 2-9. <laughs> um, but Anyway, I started off um, as a showroom demonstrator. Um, it was marvellous because we had very few customers. Uh, Hammonds were very expensive in those days because of the import. So it's really, I was getting paid to practice. Yes. Um, then we sold a, an RT3 to EMI Abbey Road Studios and they part exchanged a pre-war Hammond Model BV, which was a pre-war Hammond Model B with a new vibrato unit on it. Yeah. And I managed to buy that from the company for what they allowed mm -hmm. and had that at home. So I was playing all day, 
playing in the evening at home. Evening, yeah. And uh, then that sort of got me going. I also We also hired an organ out to a pub in the Old Kent Road, and I ended up playing there because the organist had let them down. Mm-hmm. And I ended up playing there for six months, which was a very good grounding for later on when I started to go up north and demonstrating organs and clubs and things. Um, but that's how I got involved with, with Hammond. And you did a lot of travelling with the Hammond well, Company. Do you, do you think that you were the most travelled <laughs> British organist uh, ever, perhaps? Well, I was remembering this morning as I was on the way to the station to pick you up, and I remembered that in 1964, my new boss, a wonderful man, dynamic man called Jimmy Gibbs, who was the man responsible for making the home organ industry, or creating yeah. the home organ industry, and I was a 20-year-old, and he called me into the office and said, Keith, I'm going to give you a company car. And he gave me a brand-new white Ford Zephyr 6. Not a bad car for no, a 20-year-old no. to be driving. <laughs> but what I didn't know was I was going to drive 84,000 miles in that car in two years. Wow. And we didn't have any motorways, just no, a little no. bit of the M1. So, yes, <laughs> a lot of travelling. And uh, then uh, I started overseas travelling. Uh, a colleague of mine I'd been working with had... Uh, been appointed as MD of uh, Boozy and Hawks in South Africa, mm-hmm. where we were marketing Hammond organs. And uh, he wanted me out there, and I'd, uh, that was really travelling, because I did 23 shows in 27 days, right across <laughs> South Africa, where you know the distances. Yes, yeah. You know? <laughs> so uh, that was a, an interesting experience. But uh, travelling, I mean, we were doing these Hammond showcase programmes, demonstration concerts, really. Yeah. Um, we had had an American organist, for whom I have a great regard, called Eddie Layton. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Gibbs had brought Eddie Layton over to do these shows, and I was given the job of taking him around, and Eddie was very communicative with me and shared with me a lot of his secrets of not only how to get the gimmicky sounds and bongo drums and maracas and all this stuff, uh, but he had wonderful harmonies and was showing me a lot about how he had he studied under Jesse Crawford and how he, these harmonies evolved. And uh, I was actually playing in the showroom one day and Jimmy walked in. He said, oh, God, I thought that was Eddie Layton. So I said, well, no, Eddie's back in America. Um, uh, he said, oh, can you play any of the things that he did? He said, can you do the storm in stormy weather? I said, well, yeah. Can you do the clip-clop in um, the donkey serenade? Yeah. like Eddie. Like, yeah. He said, right, OK, I can see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it didn't stop Eddie Layton coming over, incidentally, uh, because uh, he came over, I think, two, two more occasions. But I was a lot cheaper than Eddie Layton even with a company's effort. <laughs> and uh, that was my job going around. And of course, um, the word spread that these demo concerts were selling organs. Um, apart from the fact that it was conditional upon the Hammond agents, they had to do this sort of promotional activity as to keep the agency. And so much so that we then got Ina back on the scene because the two of us then, were we had enough work to keep us going. Yeah. And we actually joined forces um, for the first ever Hammond organ extravorganza, note the spelling, organza, yes, yep. clever stuff, um, <laughs> which was at Birmingham Town Hall. Okay. And we got 3,000 people there. Wow. And we introduced a local artist that was making a bit of a name for himself in a restaurant called La Reserve, um, Brian Sharp. That was Brian's first ever concert appearance. And the rest is history. Indeed. So, And so... You travelled not only South Africa, but all over Europe. Uh, well, back and forth to America, <laughs> Hong Kong. That's right, yes. Well, later on, I left Hammond UK yeah. uh, to join the Hammond Company in Chicago. Yeah. But I started off as their European marketing guy. I had a territory from Helsinki in the north to Athens in the south. I had to do two countries a week minimum. Uh, and then uh, I found the Americans weren't particularly brilliant at geography because I was sent out to places like Australia. I didn't know Australia was in <laughs> Europe, but there we are. Um, and on your way to Australia, can you just call in at Singapore and then back to South Africa as you've been there? But, and, know them. and so the next year, I was ultimately appointed Vice President for Export Sales. So apart from North America, I was travelling the world. So can you name all of the countries you've played in? Uh, well, I, too many to mention. No, but no, I mean, we were playing all over. Yeah. Um, I was a sort of one-man band for Hammond because I was doing the business side and the demonstrations, introducing new products to dealers, um, including in Japan, where we had a joint venture company, um, and uh, playing in all these different countries, um, sometimes with an interpreter, uh, other times the organ just spoke for itself. Um, it led to quite a number of radio appearances, uh, TV appearances, um, including in Hong Kong, we yes. were talking about, and <laughs> I appeared in television in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, it was a, a 
looking back, it was a bit like watching a speed up film. You know, it was ha- everything was happening. Yeah. Um, so, talk me through what would happen on one of these showcase uh, concerts. What would it just be you playing? Yes. Um, essentially, there'd be one artist. Uh, the show would last an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half. Yeah. Um, sometimes straight through, sometimes with a break. And I would have, in the early days, um, a C3, uh, probably with a couple of PR40s on it, um, and do a lot of the work on that. Then we had the smaller models, uh, the M100, the L100. Um, and uh, you, you had to entertain and keep the audience, sort of the concentration and interest. Uh, you only had the drawbars, basically, to work on. We had no programmed rhythms or anything mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. or backing tracks that all came a lot lot later um, part of the job was to convey that even a simple melody could sound really good on an organ yeah um, and to do that we would get somebody out of the audience who couldn't play and teach them how to play a very simple tune within a 10 minutes yeah um, using two proper form left hand chords and two pedals and you can do it and people could do it and of course uh, it's very hard to find the volunteer. Yes. But once you've got them doing it, the hard job is to get them to off. To get them off, yeah. <laughs> and so we talk about recordings, because obviously this is a, a good point to slot some things yes, in. Yes, yes. Uh, your first Hammond record was High Flying Hammond. Well, it, not strictly true, oh. uh, because I'd done two, two recordings before that. Uh, one, we made a giveaway, one of these floppy giveaway oh, yes, discs yep. called Playtime at the Hammond. Uh, I was 19 then. And then after that, we were in Russia. Ah, I've got this down as a separate note. Well, if we're going to go in the correct order, and there are people in this world that are very important. Yes, really, yep. Garbage <laughs> is very important. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Jimmy Gibbs, again, a very dynamic guy, and he arranged for us to exhibit at the British Industrial Exhibition. Yep. We were with Boozy and Hawks with their instruments, and Hammond had granted us the Eastern European market to develop. And uh, out there, and the Hammond had a big impact. And I was asked to make this recording for the state recording company. Yep. And we recorded this, what was an EP in those days. And uh, I was paid for it. And uh, that was fine. And, but I never got a copy of the disc. And I wondered for many, many years whether it was ever actually released. Yes. Yep. Until through the advent of the internet. And I started to get some emails come in from, from Russia. Of people with this disc and asking what model hammered it was and all that. And eventually uh, I actually got a copy of it. And um, so it was released. So that was, was actually yeah. my first EP. And then later on, uh, I was invited to do these, uh, the first LP, which was called High Flying Hammond. Yeah. And we recorded that at the uh, Jackson Studios out at Rickmansworth. Um, the son of Jack Jackson, who was a very famous band leader and then became a very creative um, disc jockey, um, playing pop records, but in between slicing comedy records together mm-hmm. it was all very clever stuff done by his son Malcolm who was a genius of a recording engineer and all in those days it was all done with uh, uh, cutting 15 yes, inch yep, tape uh, tapes with a <laughs> very sharp knife <laughs> razor blade but anyway we recorded High Flying Hammond and um, uh, it, the other thing we did was I came up with the idea of putting an insert sheet in with it with all the drawbar settings yep. so that people who were home organist, could, could see how to create the same registrations. So that did very well. And we were then bringing out a new spinet model called the Model T. Mm-hmm. So we recorded Travelling Hammond. Yeah. Ford Motor Company kindly loaned us a Model T organ to put on the front yes, cover. Yes, yeah. They didn't loan us the lovely girl. I don't know where she came <laughs> from, but she was very attractive, I have to say. Um, but uh, no, that was the second one. And then we went on, oh, we did umpteen. And, and just going back to the recording you did in Russia, you're, am I right in saying that that was the first time the Beatles were ever recorded? Yes. Now, that was something I found out again many years later because this was in the 60s when the Beatles were top of the charts. Yeah. And I recorded a medley of tunes which included a couple of Beatles tunes. Yeah. And uh, one of the emails I received was from a guy who told me that this was the first time the Beatles' music had been recorded within the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, so much so that he arranged for me to be interviewed long distance Mm -hmm. with a magazine called From Me To You, uh, telling the history of how this recording came about. This is a magazine that deals entirely of Beatles history. And so that was in one of the editions of From Me To You, available in Russia. Well, let's have a listen to that, recorded on B... Uh, That was, I think, an A100. A100. Yes, with a PR40. Hammond uh, Beatles Fantasia. 
Of course, the famous thing everybody remembers about High Flying Hammond and, of course, Travelling Hammond are the covers, which you've mentioned, yes. the Model T, but yes. also winching you up on yes. the wing of an aeroplane. Yes. Well, that was an amazing thing because uh, the covers were designed by Gillian Jackson, another of Jack's, uh, Jack's daughter. And uh, Gillian, very artistic, came up with these ideas and we were able to get the cooperation of British Eagle Airways. Uh, and you can you imagine going out to Heathrow and taking a forklift truck and climbing in and out of the uh, BAC 111. I mean, it wouldn't happen today. No, no, no. Security <laughs> the same well. Health and safety. And resulting from that, interesting enough, I was approached by a very charming man called Dennis Wingate, who was the boss, uh, UK boss, of SAM, which is the charter branch of Alitalia. Mm-hmm. And he, he was an organ fan and got this record. He said, right, we're going to send a Caravel airliner into the, B, into the Biggin Hill Airfair. And I want you to be on it, and I want you to get off at Biggin Hill onto the forklift truck and recreate this cover. Yeah. And we actually did that. Wow. And uh, which was great fun. So, how long did you stay with Hammond? Uh, Twenty six years. And what what brought that to the end? Was it the well the, <laughs> the demise of the oil business? I think in a nutshell. <laughs> well, no, it was a sad thing because uh, I thoroughly enjoyed working for Hammond uh, in all the different guises. I was very much involved towards the end in product development and things like that. Um, and it was a lovely company to work for with some great people. But the organ market worldwide uh, diminished by 60% in four years. Now, yeah. that is horrendous. Yes, yeah. Uh, the company, unfortunately, had not diversified. And looking back, it's a shame because we had what was called the secrets room where new projects were kept under wraps, and I had access to this. And, for example, we had a very, very good um, electronic piano that we could have marketed and uh, just as Yamaha have been very successful with their Clavinova range, yes, yes. Uh, Hammond could still be there. Yeah. But there we are, they paid the price. But of course, Hammond is still going uh, under Suzuki, is it not? Very yeah. much so. The, 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 fortunately, um, after a, a few hiccups and full starts, uh, Hammond ended up under the ownership of Suzuki. And they're making some remarkable products. Um, a few years ago, I uh, was playing for an organ club and uh, Hammond put in one of their latest B3 lookalike products, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I didn't even have a chance to rehearse or do a sound check. I went straight on, and it was just like playing a B3. Yeah. Um, this whole technology uh, was an interesting phase in Hammond's development because, of course, they'd been utilising the tone wheel generator since 1934, yeah. um, but that became increasingly expensive to make, uh, and it wouldn't do the new things that people were looking for, yes, yeah. the bright wave sounds, piano voicing, easy play, whatever. And I remember being summoned over to Chicago for this engineering workshop. And the first day was all talk and very boring because I didn't really understand what they were talking about, about LSI technology. Um, and the next day was a bit more interesting because we went into an area in the factory which was called the Wall of Sound. And there are the big panel with dials and lights and all this sort of stuff. And there was an umbilical cord coming out from it into a Hammond console. Yeah. And a normal Hammond drawbar console. And this American guy says, well, this is where we evaluate these new ways of creating the Hammond sound. And I'm thinking, yeah. And um, he said, well, we, what we do, we said, we've got a tone wheel generator here. So we'll just start that up. So we go, <laughs> and off we go. And he said, then we can press this switch and that will take us over to one of these new LSI packages that we're experimenting with. And uh, he said, Keith, you play the organ. And I said, okay. He said, well, you sit down and play. And he said, at some point when you're playing, I'll throw the switch. So I sit down, I play this organ for five minutes or so. And in the end, I'm getting fed up. And I stopped playing. I said, when are you going to throw the switch? He said, I already have. And that's persu- what's persuaded me. Yeah. In musical terms, that actually there is something in what they're talking about. Yes, yeah. It, it does sound the same. Um, and that was the beginning of our foray into the world of electronics. Yeah. And so um, we t- t- talking about um, Hammond organs. Have you played every model? I'm out of touch to some extent with the latest models. And the thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to is not only seeing and playing them, but the fact that, you believe it or not, you can put them under your arm. They are yeah. so lightweight. Yeah. And you and I know the weight of B3s <laughs> and even an M100 that you have and I've owned. Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, you need two very strong men. If not uh, more. But these things you can put under your arm. I mean, think of gigging. Yes. It's well, just exactly. a, yes. another world. And uh, I've already shown you here, uh, I've got one of these new small Leslies. 
Now, Leslie's are traditionally great big coffin-like things. Yep. They sound wonderful, but your wife doesn't always like them, you know. <laughs> um, but the new one, well, lovely. I've got it in my little office there, and you don't know that it's there. It's there, yeah. And it sounds a treat. So, uh, Do you have an opinion on Leslie's versus PR40s? Because I know that oh. some people have a very oh. divided opinions. You, you, you know, you, they either like one or the other. This is a bit like Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got people, uh, it's one person in particular... Uh, who I talk to quite frequently, and he just hates the thought of Leslie's. Yeah. And he won't actually have any of my old peas because they were recorded on, <laughs> with Leslie's. Uh, but I can understand because you could, you hear a Hammond with a PR40. Yeah. And now I play them occasionally when we go around to um, certain venues, um, and it's a refreshing sound. Yes. Um, and, of course, you can do things. You can, for example, you can have... On the, uh, you can have on a PR40 vibrato on the upper and uh, or not uh, yeah. and split the vibrato which you, you can't do until you want the very modern Leslie's yeah. um, but it's two different sounds Yeah, uh, and horses for courses exactly and so we've talked about the Hammond recordings but what about recordings you've made on pipes well uh, pipe organs are oh, my true love um, I was approached by OS Digital when mm-hmm. Tim Wills Uh, and his company were making a lot of organ recordings, uh, and he contacted me, which was very lovely to hear from him, but inevitably he asked would I make the first recording on a Hammond. Uh, Fair enough, uh, which we did, and we uh, made a CD which was called Hammond Showcase Revisited, Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that sold reasonably well to the point that he then came back and then said, would you like to do one on a pipe organ? Well, of course, that was wonderful. Yes. And uh, my good friends at the... Cinema Organ Society very kindly allowed me to use the ex Trocadero well at so when it was installed at the Edric Hall. Yeah. And um, we spent a very uh, interesting day making the recording. Um, as always with these things, you have to do everything in a hurry because it's expensive to employ engineers and yes, rent halls yeah, yeah. and whatever. But anyway, we made the, uh, the CD uh, on the um, Edric Hall installation. Um, and um, then I made a further recording... I've been working quite closely with the uh, good guys up in Glasgow Mm -hmm. um, and the installation at at Clydebank Town Hall. And I recorded a CD there, uh, which was called Ritz Beckingham. Um, And then more recently, um, I played for the Theatre Organ Club uh, for their AGM. And I made a, the the concert was recorded and issued as a CD. uh, And that was called Any Other Business. And don't forget your first cinema organ recording on cassette. Uh, the two sides of Keith Beckingham. That's right. Well, that was a, a an amazing story because it was in one of Hammond's anniversary years and we were taking this show round and Alan Ashton approached me and asked if I would like to do a show um, at the BBC Playhouse Theatre. Yeah. Uh, half on the Wurlitzer and half on Hammond. And we put the uh, this idea together and uh, Alan was assured by the powers that be, that the organ would be tuned in the morning and I could get in for about half past two and get to know the uh, ex-Empress Wurlitzer yeah. and get the Hammond set up. Well, I got there at quarter past two. The place was locked. And I saw two guys pacing up and down. It turned out they were the organ tuners who had been waiting there since the morning. Oh so anyway, eventually we got into the building and I said to them, I said, look, can I just have 10 minutes on the organ just to get some thoughts in my mind as to what sort of program I might play. Yeah. And then it's all yours to tune and that's it. Well, I sat down at the organ and the first thing I found was C and G were missing on the grate. Didn't play. <laughs> so we then had to do major surgery on it. Oh dear. And I literally got 10 minutes to play. Uh, I managed to get some pistons set up blind. Yeah. Um, and then I got 10 minutes to play it just before the audience came in. And I remember being introduced by Alan and I... When I came on and I tapped this console on, 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 on nobody saw it, but I tapped it and I said, don't let me down. <laughs> <laughs> and to my horror, of course, it was recorded for, for Alan's show. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometime afterwards, Ken Mellor came along and had got, got a copy of this tape and said, would I mind having it issued? Um, and that's how it came out as two sides of Keith Beckingham. That's how it happened. Do you have, over all of the years you've been travelling around the world, do you have a, a particular favourite memory or something that happened that stuck with you? Oh, I don't know. I, I, there's so many different things that happened. Um, <laughs> or a funny story. <laughs> well, I'll I, I tell, tell you one thing. The, 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 Hammond, the, the, the Hammond name can be helpful. 
When I was out in Australia, yeah. and I went there quite often because EMI were our distributor there, and it was a London-based company, so I was going out there four times a year. And on one of these occasions, I was going on to New Zealand, mm -hmm. and then travelling back from New Zealand back to Japan, where you're working, we're going to launch the B3000. So it was a very critical sort of time frame on this. Yeah. When I was in Australia, I was interviewed on a radio program called The Caroline Jones Show, which was a very well-known program and listened to by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I then went on and did a concert at, not in, in, in City Town Hall, one of the small halls adjacent to the, but a part of the complex there. Yeah. And, uh, um, which all went down very well. I then went on to New Zealand, did my shows. I was doing concerts way down in Christchurch. And I started the homeward journey, which was to fly back to Sydney and then connect with a flight, overnight flight to uh, Osaka. Mm -hmm. Everything was going well until I get to Sydney Airport and present my ticket and I'm told that I'm not on the Osaka flight. Well, I mean, I was on such a tight schedule. Yes. So I thought, I've got to thought, sort this out. So I asked to speak to the duty supervisor at the airline who came out and uh, got into conversation. He, he said, uh, oh, he said, you're Keith Beckham. Now, this doesn't happen very often, <laughs> I, I must tell you. So, right, um, he said, oh, he said, my daughter plays the house. She came to your concert. She heard you on the Caroline Jones programme. She went to your concert. I said, oh, this is fantastic. So I'm trying to explain to him my plight. Yes. All he wants to do, he said, I'll tell you what, look, we'll have a, let's get my daughter on the phone here. She, she won't believe who I'm talking. You have a chat with her. I said, look, I'd love to do it, but look, meantime, oh, no, I'll sort no, 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 Is that you? Yeah. No. <laughs> you never guess what I'm talking. Well, we had this this conversation. I was somewhat preoccupied, yes, but yeah. I, it's a lovely girl to talk to. And uh, next thing is, uh, he's oh, I've sorted all that out. Right, so next thing, I'm flying first class to Osaka. So I wasn't complaining. <laughs> but that was one uh, one thing that was uh, that was fun. And the, the other thing that was was uh, uh, fun was uh, you get phone calls. Yes, and you never know quite where they're going to lead. Uh, it now happened more with emails, but the phone is funny. <laughs> I had a young female voice on the phone. Keith, but yes. Do you play game show organ? Game show organ? So anyway, she's ringing up there. Ant and Deckard presenting a new programme on television mm -hmm. where they revisit the game shows from the 1960s. Yes. And they want to do a revival of, um, um, oh, what was it called? The one from Norwich. The game show from Norwich. Um, anyway, very popular game show. Yeah. It's the name of which eludes me. But anyway, they wanted me to play... Uh, this hammered organ for this bit. So I go down there and I have the most amazing day and uh, we record the show live before an audience in the mm -hmm. evening. And uh, um, I'm not sure whether it was Ant or Deck that took a great interest in the hammered organ, came over and had a try and it actually got me into camera shot. Yes. And uh, the funniest thing was I recorded it on the Tuesday night and it was going out the following Saturday, mm -hmm. peak viewing. And so I watched it on television and uh, next thing the phone went <laughs> and it was one of my wife's friends, and I answered the phone. He said, Keith, oh, oh, oh it, it can't, I, I thought you were on television. I've just been watching, I, I thought it was you on television. I said, what was that? He said, well, I've been watching um, a, a, a game show revival thing, and you were playing, the a chap like you, he looked just like you. I said, I wouldn't play for a show like that. <laughs> oh, the magic of technology. The magic of technology. And so... You're quite comfortable here in the Cotswolds in your nice cottage. Oh, lovely. Yes, we're very happy here. We, we moved to Rissington nearly a year ago and we've settled in very nicely. We've got some lovely neighbours and it's that, a lovely, friendly village. That was after your annual moves that you kept doing. We, we couldn't get it right. We, had a, we lived for 13 years in Bryce Norton. The house was too big, the garden was too big, and we made several moves that just didn't work for us. And now I think we finally got it back. The house is actually slightly bigger than we had at Bryce Norton, <laughs> but the garden is a lot, lot smaller, which is, uh, means it's totally manageable. But no, it's a lovely, lovely part of the world to live. We're very privileged to live in the, in the Cotswolds. And you've got your Hammond set up. I've got my Hammond, my little music room, and I've got my Hammond with the Leslie. I've got a, a digital piano in there, and my desk, my filing cabinet, my hi-fi, and uh, that's my little musical world. And you've still got a relatively full concert diary? <laughs> yes, I mean... Um, I am slowing down on the concert scene um, as the years tick by. Yeah. Um, but uh, And I suppose, um, it sounds awful, doesn't it? But I, I'm in a position where I can pick and choose what I want to do. Um, and that shouldn't put anybody off contact to me because I'm sure <laughs> I won't come and play your lovely organ. But no, I have to sort of work it out that um, it doesn't involve too much travelling and yeah. all that sort of thing. 
Um, my wife likes it. We try and where possible to uh, maybe tie in an extra day to visit somewhere interesting, yeah. um, which is always nice. So, uh, but I you know the concert. I still get a buzz. Yeah, uh, and I think the day you don't is the time to give up. And of course, you've got the exciting opportunity uh, to play the truck organ well, once again. <laughs> yes, I, I I can't tell you how excited I am about that because um, I may be one of the very few people left that will have played it there in all three locations. I think that Len probably is the only other person. Yes, so um, I mean uh, we played it in the truck in all its glory and all yeah. its lovely stereo sound. We played it in the Edric Hall, and thank goodness it was saved. Yes. Uh, and it could sound very nice in the Edric Hall. Yep. Um, but I went to the opening, and I can remember sitting up in the circle and hearing um, uh, that organ played in this wonderful stereo sound. Um, and Richard Hills just made it. It was the sounds that I, I just... I couldn't believe that we yes. were hearing that yep. again and that we'd be able to create that. It, it, it's, it, it's trot plus. Yes. It's got all the memories that divide it up, but plus this lovely American influence, the extra voxes, the extra tibia, all those things that make it what it is. And so I can't wait to get my hands on it. And was it, was it, was it special in the, the truck when it was originally there? It was. It was a very special organ. In fact, William Davis did, I think, one of the first ever stereo broadcasts mm-hmm. uh, from the truck, so they would capture the sound. But it was a, uh, it was a lovely instrument. Uh, it sounded a treat. Um, and I've got recordings, for example, I've got a recording of um, Gerald Shaw doing a broadcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he played um, what I thought was the definitive arrangement of Dancing Years until I heard Richard Hills. Um, but uh, uh, yes, Gerald playing and he did Runaway Rocking Horse, all those lovely light music pieces that were popular at that era and still are yeah. very popular amongst people like myself and other organ enthusiasts. Was that, is that your favourite instrument or is that, is that like the impossible <laughs> question? <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to play any of the big American Wurlitzers, uh, and therefore I know I'm missing a part of organ history, um, and I uh, envy people like Simon and Richard who go out there frequently. Yeah. Um, they're such brilliant musicians, they can take full advantage of what those organs can do. But certainly, uh, I do remember um, playing the Odeon Manchester Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I was very young at the time, but I remember I played Old Man River. I just heard George Wright play it. Um, and I managed to get some of those sounds. And Manchester Odeon, ex Paramount, was a lovely organ. Lovely organ. Its original yes, organ. Yeah. Again, big divide. It's cinema. that big, yeah. rich sound that is something else. And you, you never played any of the big American organs? Sadly when not. You no. Didn't no, have time. No, it, the, the, the schedule was such. I did play one or two theatre organs when I was in Australia, yeah. um, but not in America. That's a great shame. Yeah, it's one of those things. Um, ironically, uh, I heard Dan Bellamy playing. He launched the B3000 mm-hmm. uh, in a trade show in America, and I brought Dan over to the UK, and uh, uh, he introduced the B3000. And, you know, I've spent so much time with Dan, I don't know why we never talked about theatre organ. And I was, some years later, I was running Chapel of Bond Street for Yamaha, and I looked out of my office and, to my amazement, there was Dan's in the music department. We had yeah. this gorgeous music department that sold everything under the sun. And so I went out and Dan and I, well, he couldn't believe I was there and he was there. So we went out and had a coffee and he said, well, I'm over here to play for the Cinema Organ Society. Now, I have to admit that I had lost touch with the COS because I was just so totally involved with, with Hammond. With Hammond, yeah. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to play for the Cinema Organ Society at the Edric Hall. And I said, well, I've never heard the word it's in the Edric Hall. I've heard various reports about it, some yeah. good, some bad. Uh, I'll come along and hear. But then next day I got a letter, a very charming letter from David Lowe, mm-hmm. inviting me to come to the concert, sending me a ticket, and would like to have a chat when we got there. Well, I enjoyed Dan's concert. The organ sounded fabulous. And he even made it sound like a Hammond. He had this <laughs> wonderful habit of being able to find Hammond sounds yes. on the word, <laughs> so, which is the most strange way of doing it. It's usually the other way around, isn't it? So... Um, um, I, I heard uh, Dan's brilliant performance and David came up to me and said, would you like to come down and try it? Well, of course I'd like to try it. So I went down the following week and uh, started to play it and well, the rest is history because uh, I said, well, it was, uh, it was just love. I mean, I knew it was going to be good, but it was so, I so enjoy getting back to it. Yeah. And uh, then um, got roped into the COS, started to play. In those days I had these uh, meetings at the Edric Hall on Fridays. Mm-hmm. And um, 
members could go along and try the organ and do a sort of 10 minute stint. And um, then at the end of the evening, they'd have somebody come along and do a half an hour, 45 minute sh- uh, spot. And I was invited to do a number of these. That's when I adopted um, You Wonderful You, yeah. and, uh, which seemed to suit the organ. And uh, then I think I did some recording for Nigel on it for the organist entertains, uh, and then a number of concerts on it at the Edric Hall. Uh, lovely organ. Yeah. Well, Keith, I think we've covered everything, unless there's anything. What a shame! Right? <laughs> there is one. There is one yes. other thing I, I can ask you, which yeah. I, I like to ask yeah. people, which is, if what advice would you give to a young musician or you know somebody just starting out? Either playing the organ or yeah. music in general. Yeah. What what would be your? Oh right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so much actually, but uh, it's a it's a question of playing and playing and playing. It's a question of listening, listening, and listening. Um, not being afraid to ask. Try and watch an organist play. Yeah. Don't try and just imitate and One nothing person. else. Yeah. Don't try and do that. Um, by all means, find out how they do things, but develop your own style. Yeah. Um, the piano is still the foundation instrument. You need to get good piano technique, and I'm not selling pianos anymore now, so I'm not <laughs> fast. Um, but um, although I did enjoy selling for a very long time, but because uh, I love the piano. Uh, but yes, piano technique is the way forward. Um, you talk about Reginald Dixon. You talk about Joseph Seal. They yeah. all had pianos at home and practiced diligently. Yeah. Um, and so the piano is very, very important. Um, now, uh, unlike in my day, when there was nobody around that could teach me how to play entertainment music on the organ, mm-hmm. now there are, and through the Cinema Organ Society in particular, and uh, Theatre Organ Club, um, things that are happening in Rye and other parts of the world where young people are being really encouraged into the organ world, yeah. there are these opportunities. And that's a great thing. Yeah. Um, and if I ever won the lottery, one thing I would love to create would be a sort of foundation where we could put an organ in to a place that was available 24 hours a day yeah. and where we could have teachers encourage youngsters to play, give concerts and things like that. Um, because it, it amazed me that um, we've managed to attract people like Simon and Richard mm-hmm. who have come into it... In, a latter time, um, when organs were by that time mainly out of cinemas in yeah. their new homes, <laughs> um, and we've attracted that we have a new wave of younger people now coming along who are very very fine players. Yeah. So um, as I'm in my the autumn of my life, so to speak, I'm very delighted there are these younger players who are doing some great things. Yeah, great things. It's wonderful. Well, Keith, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much for having me It's been over. a pleasure. It's been uh, a pleasure, David. I was about to say coming to deepest, darkest uh, in the Cotswold, <laughs> but it's a lovely sunny day. It's a lovely here, sunny so. day we arranged for you. That's lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. Not at all.